It's a tremendous pleasure, it's a zchus, it's an honor to be again in the office of Chazak, to be hosted by this wonderful organization. They do so much for Hashem, for His nation, to increase and glorify Torah, to raise awareness. It's really breathtaking to watch what they do and the Messiah's nefesh that they exemplify while doing what they do. And it's all done with one thing in mind. Lehagdil Torah uleha adira. To increase Hashem's awareness and glory among Klal Yisrael. And they have such a slacha. Because they do it Lashem Shemai. So whatever we can do to be a part, to help them, to show our support, is a tremendous thing because then we become part of this unbelievable endeavor and great success. And in Mitz Hashem, they should have, in fact, fantastic siyat of Dishmael to continue to escort them in whatever they do. Hashem Shemaim, that's the key in Hatzlacha. So whatever we can do to be a part of Chazak, it will be a tremendous, tremendous chus for us and for anyone who gets involved. In Parashat HaShavua, Parashat Lech we read about the first test of Avraham Avinu. First of ten tests. Great tests. And the first test is, Lech Lecha Me'artzecha Umimoladcha Mibeis Avicha. I want you to leave everything behind. I want you to leave your house. The neighborhood, your town, your friends, everything that you're familiar with. And I want you to start marching. So Avraham Avinu says, but where am I going? What should I Right in ways. What do I? Where do I go? And Uncle Tishbaba says, "No, you just start walking. Take your suitcases and start walking." But where am I going? All information will be given on a need-to-know basis. And Avamavino has no idea where he's going, so he takes his bags and he starts walking. What a great Messiah! Why didn't Hashem tell him where you're going? Because when you know the destination, even though it's far, but at least you have a goal in mind. And you start calculating, okay, it's going to take me such and such. Every day I'm going to do this amount of miles. You know, I'll be able to stop over here at this rest stop. I'll be able to go to this gas station. I'll grab something to eat in this place. Yeah, that's actually, actually kind of nice of a place. There's a vista point over there. I'll be able to see the great scenery. But when you have no idea where you're going, it increases the challenge so much. So this is the first test. Lech lech me'artzecho. Get away from everything that you're familiar with. The last and tenth test is the Akeda Akedas Yitzhak. When a Yitzhak of Vinu on the altar and attempting to slaughter Yitzhak of Vinu. Is there a connection between the first and the tenth test? Our sages explain, yes, there is. The first test is Avraham Avinu. Are you willing? To let go of your past for HaKodesh Baruch Hu. Leave everything that you're familiar with, that you grew up with, that is regular, that is normal, that you're used to. Everything that you're familiar with, leave it for the sake of HaKodesh Baruch Hu. Are you willing to do that? And Avraham Avinu says yes. What's the essence of the tenth test? Ki Yitzhak is supposed to be the continuation of Avraham. Avraham Avinu was promised. You're going to have a kid. His name is going to be Yitzhak. And he will continue your tradition. And now, plan B, change your plan. Now you're commanded to slaughter that son. In essence, are you willing to forgo your future for Hashem? Past and future, all for Rebbeinu Shiloh And Avraham Avinu says, Amen, Amen. Everything for Kodesh Baruch that's the ultimate in dedication, loyalty, commitment. So many times we look at past events and we ask, but, but why? Lama! Why did this happen? So many times when we think about the future, we ask, what's going to be? People are nervous. People are scared. What's going to be? And why did this happen? When Avraham Avinu embarked on his journey, for some reason the Torah says, you know how old he was? He was 75 years old. And I want to ask a provocative question. Who cares? 
We don't know his shoe size. We don't know what car he drove. So who cares that he was 75 years old at the time of this great test of Lech Lecha Me'artzecha. Lama, why has a numerical value of 75? Lamed is 30, Mem is 40, He is 5, that's 75. That's the question about the past. Mayhiye, what's going to be? Has a numerical value, not surprising, of 75. Ma, Mem, He is 45. Yihiye is another 30, that's 75 together. Who asks? Ma, Lama, Ma, Yihiye. Why did this happen? What's going to be? Who asks these questions? A person who doesn't have bitachon. Because bitachon has the same numerical value. 75. Bet is 2. Tet is 9. Chet is 8. Vav is 6. And Nun is 50. That's 75. But when you have true bitachon, you rely on a Kodesh Baruch you surrender to a Kodesh Baruch you don't have the question of, Lama, why did this happen? Ma'yihye, what will be? Because you know you're in good hands. In the best hands. You're in the hands of Rebbeinu Shilayla. And maybe that's the reason the Torah says. You know how old the Vavavinu was when he went to Eretz Yisrael, starting his journey, not knowing where he's going, leaving everything behind. He went with 75, not 75 years, 75 representing Bitachon. That's how you travel. That's how you conduct your life. 75, when you have that Mida of Bitachon, you never worry. You never scared. Never nervous. You're in the hands of Rebbeinu Shalom. You can do anything. Leaving your past. Letting go of your future. Just doing the right thing. Committed to Hashem. Dedication. Loyalty. Mesirus Nefesh. You know what Mesirus Nefesh is for Kodesh Baruch Commitment. Dedication. Recently in Eretz Yisrael, there was a big raffle in a big department store and the policy of the store was that anyone who buys six items or more is entitled to get into the raffle. For a hundred thousand dollars. There was a yeshiva man, Shiva Bachel, in Bnei Bak, who doesn't have too much money. And he wanted to participate in this raffle, so he sent his son to the store to buy six packages of pasta. His son runs to the store, it was in a different city. He bought the six packages of pasta. He comes back home. And on one of the notes that the store gave him, he wrote down all the information. Their name, the phone number, the address. And he forgot all about it. Forgot all about it. A month later, the manager of the store calls his father and says, Mazatov, you just won the raffle. And that guy is so happy. $100,000 can really help this family. He is so excited. So the manager says, you, you can come into the store whenever you want. So I'll come in today. Just don't forget to bring the receipt. So the father says, sure. And he starts looking for the receipt. He looks all over the house. Can't find the receipt. He turns the house all over. Can't find the receipt. So he goes to the store and he goes to the manager and he says, listen, I'm so sorry. You asked me to bring the receipt. I can't find it, but I'm sure you can find it in your computer. And the guy says, but you have to show us the receipt. So he said, yeah, but if it's on your computer, why don't you care? What do you, what do you care? Maybe you should try. Try to look for it. And he pressured him, and the manager agreed, and he started looking for the receipt of this person in the computer. He looks, and he looks, and he looks, and he looks, and he finally finds it. A month before, in fact, on the day that he said that he was there. But then the manager says to him, you said that you bought six packages of pasta. The receipt only shows five packages of pasta. So you know what that means? You're not eligible to participate in the raffle. And this person came all the way from Nebak. He's smiling. He's so happy. He says, do you realize what I'm saying now? According to the policy of the store, this is not legal. You didn't win $100,000. I'm so sorry, but... The receipt said, you only bought five packages of pasta. I'm so sorry. And this man is smiling. He's really happy. So the manager says, do you understand what I'm saying? You're not going to get the money. And the guy says, yeah, of course I understand. You said, you have the receipt for five packages of pasta, but you need six in order to participate in the raffle. So why in the world are you smiling? 
He says, what do you mean why? Don't you understand? I have six packages of pasta at home. But you're saying I only paid for five. That means if I didn't come here today and I didn't know about this, I would be holding something stolen in my house. One package of pasta belonging to you and I would never pay for it. Oh, I would go over what the Torah says, don't steal. Oh, Hashem, I found out about this. The money, don't worry about it. The Kodesh Baruch who decides to give the money can decide to take it away. He can decide to give me money in a different way if he chooses to. But Hashem saved me from a transgression even though it was unintentional. That's true, Bittachem. That's commitment, loyalty, dedication to Hashem. You know, recently I heard of an amazing story. There was a lot of people waiting online to hop on a bus. A lot of people. There was one guy, chutzpinik, cuts off in front of everyone. And people yelled at him, well, what are you doing? What are you doing? It's chutzpah. Why do you cut off here? Stand in line. Go all the way to the back. And this guy doesn't even blink, doesn't look back, doesn't care. And this guy is yelling at him, and this guy is yelling at him, and this old lady is yelling at him. And he just keeps going, advancing to the front of the line, and he just doesn't care. At one point, there was a big guy in the crowd who really didn't like this. So he went over to this guy, and he gave him a punch in his nose. The guy fell down, then he stood up, and he went all the way back to the end of the line. Some people looked at him and said, we don't understand. We yelled at you. So many people told you, what are you doing? It's chutzpah, don't do this. And you didn't care. This guy punches you once in the nose and that's it. You go all the way to the back and he says, well, let me explain to you. You guys, when you yelled at me, you just told me. This guy with his punch explained it to me. We've been through tough two years. Very tough. The coronavirus so many tragedies in Meron, in Miami, in Karlin. These are tragedies that we're all familiar with, public ones, but there are so many individual ones. Such tough years. If Tavshin Ayin Chet and Tavshin Ayin Tet, four years ago and three years ago, they told us, they yelled at us. But in Tafshin Pei and Tafshin Pei Aleph, they punched us, in, punched us in the nose. They actually explained to us. But we don't have to wait until we get the punch in the nose. We have to wake up when we hear the yelling. When we hear the, the first explanation. We can interpret it as an explanation. We shouldn't wait for bad news. We shouldn't wait for that punch in the nose to awaken to be loyal to HaKadosh Baruch 24-7. It's been rough two years. And you know, it's an interesting phenomenon. We love hearing bad news. And the more negative the news is, the more we're attracted to it. Why is it? Just imagine if they would put out a daily newspaper. Only good things. Yesterday, Mr. Cohen did a siyu mashas. Mr. Levy was able to watch his eyes and not to look where he's not supposed to. Mr. Yehuda was able to daven three times with kavana throughout the Shemona Yisrael. Woo! So exciting. Mr. Asher had a baby boy after 10 years of not having kids. A new yeshiva was built on this in this street and you can keep on imagining the good news that this newspaper would have. You know how long this newspaper would last? Maybe a day, maybe two. Not interesting. It would go under. Why is that? We would like to say that we like to hear good news, so why is it that we're so attracted to bad news, to negativity? In order to understand that, maybe let's tell the story. It is known that there are three who went to HaKadosh Baruch The first one was, Aleinu L'Shabech. The tefillah we say at the end of every davening, Aleinu L'Shabech. Aleinu L'Shabech came to HaKadosh Baruch and said, HaKadosh Baruch it's not fair. You know, your children made me into tefillah taderech. They were saying it, you know, when they're halfway already out of the shul. Aleinu L'Shabech. That's not Aleinu L'Shabech. What is that? 
אין עלינו לשבח קמפליין תו השם. סעודה שלישית של ישודס אוסו קיים תו השם אין קמפליין, you know, the first and second meal of Shabbat, your people, they're having fish and meat, Ooh, what type of meat, five types of meat, and shol and and what not, glamorous, elaborate meals, woo, של ישודס, maybe if I'm lucky, I get a tuna salad, sometimes an egg salad, it's not fair. Am I not one of the three meals of Shabbos? This is just not fair. Malach HaMavis also came to Hashem to complain. And Malach HaMavis says to Hashem, you know, people complain. Look! Look! Malach HaMavis took this guy and Malach HaMavis took this guy and I'm just trying to do my job. And Hashem tried to appease these three. And Hashem says to Aleinu Shabbat, don't worry. We're going to plug you in in the middle of Musaf, of Rosh Hashanah, Davening, and of Yom Kippur. Don't worry. People will pay attention to every single word they say while saying, Aleinu L'Shabach, you're going to be in the middle of Musaf. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, people will bow down with a, with a lot of kavanah. And Aleinu L'Shabach was appeased. HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to Shalishudas to the third meal on Shabbos, don't worry. You'll be the special, most exalted time of the week by the Hasidim. By the Hasidim, by the Tish, by the Rebbe. Shalishudis is called Rava de Ravi, and it's a very, very propitious time. And they sing with such dvekus, clinging to Hashem. It's a very special time by the Hasidim. And Shalishudis was appeased. To Malach Amaves, the Kodesh Baruch, who said, Don't worry, no one will ever blame you. People go to a funeral, what do they say? Oh, how old was he? Oh, what did he have? Oh, he had cancer. Wow. It was a car accident. It was a terrorist attack. It was a collapse of a building. It was... No one is going to accuse you, Malach HaMavis. They're all going to say it's, you know, different crazy reasons why this person had to be taken away. And Malach HaMavis was appeased, but this is really how it is. We always try to find the reason why certain things happen. And when this happens, we don't have to look into ourselves and say maybe we need to change. So we ask, why is it? that we're so attracted to bad news. The answer is a startling one. It's a very deep one though. When everything is going great and you're aware of it, you owe something to someone. When you realize Hashem is showering you all day long, every single day with so much good, you have to do His will. But when you're always looking at the negative, Oh, look what it happened here. Look at this tragedy. Look what happened there. That I'm not obligated. It's not my fault. It's because of him. It's because of that. It's because of this. Why did this have to happen? And that distances us from HaKadosh Baruch from our obligations, from our commitment to Hashem. Perhaps that is the reason we like to look at negative news. But that is the Midah of Amalek. Amalek always looks at the wrong, at the bad, at the short com- shortcomings. The Rishonim say, in Parashat Bereshit, the Pasuk says about Yetzir HaRa, Rak, Ra, Kol, Hayom. Only bad, all day long. Look at the end of those words, end letters of each of those words. There's a concept called Rashi Tevos, when we look at each letter of the beginning of the word. But there is a concept called Soyfei Tevos. The ending letters of each of those words. Rak is kuf. Ra, bad, is ayin. Kol is lamed and hayom is mem. Those letters form the word amalek. Because amalek always chooses to focus on the bad. That is not the midah of yidins. With that we can understand the connection. Between the end of Parashat Ki Tetzeb and the beginning of Parashat Bikurim. Pasha Kitetse ends with the story of Amalek. You have to erase the name of Amalek. Pasha Kitavu starts with the mitzvah of Bikuri. What's the connection between the two? Amalek looks at the negative. That's what he does for a living. That's what he focuses on. What is Bikuri? Person had 50 new grapes growing in his vineyard. Woo! So he takes those um, so grapes from the first grapes or from the first figs. And he goes and he runs to Yerushalayim to say thank you to Hashem. 
He doesn't live in Yerushalayim necessarily. He lives in Haifa. He lives, I don't know where. He is going to pack his bag and go say thank you to Hashem for those 50 new grapes that grew in his vineyard. That's the Midah of Klav Yisrael. And that's the rectification of Amalek. Amalek looks at the negative. Looks at the bad. Emphasizes it. We look at the positive. We'll run to Yerushalayim to say thank you to Kodesh Baruch in his base of Migdash because that's what we're supposed to focus on. And when we thank Hashem, it's no different than when a kid thanks his father. Imagine a father comes home and he gives his kid a gift. And the kid says, Dad, you already gave me this last year. This doesn't work. Oh, I can't stand it. Does the father have any cheshek to give more to his son? Of course not. But what happens when this father comes home and he gives a gift to his son and his son says, Wow, Dad, that's great. That's awesome. I was really looking forward to this. I was waiting for this solo. How did you know I'm going to like this? This is great. I love it. The father just wants to give him more and more. Shower him with more and more gifts. More kindness. Avinu Malkeinu, we say. Kodesh Bochum, our father, our king. But he is first our father, Avinu. And when we say thank you to everything that we have, for everything that Kodesh Bochum gives us, Kodesh Bochum just wants to give us more. With all the hardship, and there was so much suffering these past two years, But just think about how much good you got. How many people attended or made a Brit this past year? How many people attended or made a Bar Mitzvah or a Bat Mitzvah? A wedding for their son or daughter. How many people attended a Pidyon Aben? Started a new job. There is so much good. So much that we are showered with. You got up this morning? Your eyes were working, your digestive system was fine, your knees are operating, your shoulders feel okay, you can smile. Where is the thank you for that? When we thank you, who just wants to give us more and more and more. Let me ask a question which is going to sound like, sound like a funny or maybe silly question. It is now Zayn Cheshva. In Eretz Yisrael, we start asking for rain today. So we're starting the winter. Do you know how much winter, how much snow, I'm sorry, will fall this year? How much snow will fall this year? Sounds like a funny question because I'm not a meteorologist, nor am I a prophet. I'm not sure that most of the viewers are prophets or meteorologists. And yet, I ask, how much snow will fall this winter? Any idea? How do we approach this question? The answer is, every single morning in davening in Shaharit, we say the answer to this in Psuki de Zimra. The answer is found in Tehillim that David Amelech authored. Kuf Mem Zayn, 147. Pasuk Tet Zayn, the 16th verse. Anoy Sen Sheleg Katsamia. Hashem gives snow like wool. What does that mean? Don't I know snow is white like wool? What does that mean? Rashi explains, and the Imre Emes elaborates based on that Rashi. An amazing concept. Two people come out in the middle of the winter. Come out of the house, and one of them says, It's freezing! I can't take it. The other one says, It was such a nice day. Beautiful. How is this possible? Is it really freezing outside, or is it comfortable? Is it gorgeous weather? What is it? The answer is, Kodesh Baruch Hu gives a person the amount of Yisuri, afflictions, according to the amount of wool that he has. He will feel the pain, he will feel cold, just according to um, the amount of wool that he has. Rashi explains, if a rich person goes outside and he can afford buying a new coat, he's going to feel colder than the poor person who doesn't really have the money to buy a new coat. He's not going to feel so cold because you're not equipped to deal with that freezing cold. The cold and the snow are just a muscle, they're example. To afflictions, to suffering, to challenges that we have to go through in life, we are only faced with a challenge according to what we're equipped with to be able to pass the test, to deal with the challenge. So how much snow will fall this year? The answer is according to how much wool you have. 
The snow represents the challenges that we will have, and we don't ask for challenges, but if they come, we embrace them and we accept them with love because we know it's coming from Akkadish Baruch Yisbaruch. How much snow will fall? Exactly, exactly. According to the amount of wool, exactly according to what you are equipped to deal with in order to get you closer to Akkadish Baruch, because that's the essence of a test. Look at Avraham Avinu, how close he got to Rebbein Shalom because of the tests. There's another Pasuk in Tehillim. Kuf Yud Chet, 118, Pasuk Hei, fifth verse. David HaMelech says, I call to Hashem, Min HaMeitza, when it's really narrow, can't really pass. I call to Hashem. And then he makes it a little wider, but what is hiding behind this Pasuk? Min HaMeitza sounds like as if there is one superfluous letter. You can make it shorter. You can say Mehameitza from the straits, not Min HaMeitza. Why did you say Min HaMeitza? I think Min HaMeitza suggests from the inside, from the Kishkes, from the inside, from the Toch, from the Pnimius of the Meitza, of the challenge of the narrow path that you're supposed to pass. So what is inside the Meitza that David HaMelech is calling to HaKadosh Baruch from? Hameitza is spelled in Tehillim. Hey, Mem, Sadi, and Reish. In Hebrew, every letter has a revealed part and a concealed part. For example, take the Aleph. Aleph, we see the Aleph, that's the revealed part. Inside is a Lamed and Fe. That's how you write the letter Aleph. Aleph, Lamed, Fe. So what's inside the Meitza that David the Melech is calling a Kodesh Baruch and teaching all of us to do the same? Hameitza is spelled hey mem tzadi resh. Hey is spelled hey hey. So there is a hey inside the hey. Mem is spelled mem mem. So there's another another mem inside that mem. Tzadi is spelled tzadi dalid yud. So there's dalid and yud inside the tzadi. And resh is spelled resh shin. So we have the letter shin hiding inside the meitza. So the letters inside the word hameitza form the words. Yad Hashem. To know that it's all from Hashem. And when you know it's all from Hashem, and you call to Hashem, mean Hameitza Karasika, I call on you Hashem. Then, Bamerchav Ananika, then Kodesh Baruch Hu makes it wide, and you're able to pass, you're able to get through the challenge. In Shulchan Oroch, Oachayim Simen Reish Chav Beis, Seif Gimel Shulchan Oroch, rules, Paskins Lahalacha. Chayavadam Levarech Al Hara, one has to say thank you for bad things. In the same manner, in the same way that he says thank you and he says a blessing when good things happen. And he says a Shechiyano and he says a Tov and Hameti. The Mishnah Bura explains. Because when you know it's all from HaKadosh Baruch you will realize it's all good. It's all coming to help us. This is what we need. If it wasn't, we wouldn't receive it. So it's coming from our Creator who knows exactly what we need to get closer to Him in our avoidance Hashem, in our service of Hashem. So how can you not say a bracha, for bad things, in the same manner you said it for good things, the Sheikh Yaru, because you realize both come from HaKadosh Baruch The goal Mivilna lost his daughter, a few days before her chuppah. And after the shiva, his mother came to him in a dream and said, you should know. If you would only know your reward for accepting this strict judgment with love, you would have danced in her levaya, in her funeral, more so than you would have danced in her chuppah, under the chuppah in the wedding. Be willing to accept Yisurim, afflictions, be'ahava, with love. We learn it from Avraham Avinu. What Yisurim? Ten unbelievable tests. There was a guy by the name of Ruven who worked for the Shin Bet, the Israeli Shin Bet, comparable to the FBI. And he told a remarkable story. When they were training them, the main goal in mind was, no matter what happens, if you are ever caught by the enemies, you do not give over any information, even if your life is at stake. And this was stressed so many times, and the training was so intense. And he moved up in the ranking, and it became in a very important position 
in the organization, but one day, the worst thing that he ever feared happened, and three Arabs kidnapped him. And they knew what he does, and he knew, they knew his position in the organization, and therefore they tortured him. And they said, we want you to give over the information, and he said, no way. You can do whatever you want. I'm not, going to do, I'm not going to give you over even one word. And they tortured him day and night for three consecutive days. And this was so, so, so difficult for him. But he was not revealing anything. After three days, one of the Arabs comes to him and says, Luven, you have until tomorrow at 12 p.m. to tell us what we want to know. And if you don't, we will kill you. If you do, we let you go. You go back home to your wife and four beautiful young children. You have until 12 p.m. And the Arab left. And Uven stays in his tiny little cell and he starts thinking, I did so much already for this organization. Why do I have to suffer this? Do I want my wife to become a young widow? Do I want my children to become orphans? At this young age? And Uven decided that tomorrow he's going to reveal to them everything that they want. And then hopefully they will let him go. And he will be able to go back to his family. This was just too much. After he reached this decision, Uven suddenly hears all kinds of noises behind the wall. So he puts his ear to the wall and he can't believe it. The three Arabs that kidnapped him are speaking in Hebrew. And he starts thinking, he says, how is this possible? Oh, it must be that this is just a test. They're probably also working for the same organization. And this is just a test, test check, checking my dedication, my loyalty to the organization. So once he realizes it's a test, he says, I'm not going to reveal anything to them. Why should I reveal anything to them? They're working for me. They're working for us, for the same organization. And with that thought, he falls asleep. Following day, as promised, 11.30, the Arab comes back with the other two guys. He pulls a gun and he says, Ruben, so what's going to be? Did you decide? Do you want to cooperate? Are you going to reveal what we want to know? Are you going to tell us the information that we need? And Ruben says, absolutely not. If you want, go ahead. Kill me. I'm not saying a word. And the Arab says, you remember, we told you 12 p.m. It's now 11.30. You have 30 minutes to change your mind. Or else. And he shows him the gun. And Uven says, doesn't make a difference what you're going to do. I'm not telling you a word. 11.59, they come back with the gun. The Arab puts the gun to Uven's head. And he says to him, so Uven, what's going to be? You decide. You don't want to see your wife. You don't want to see your four children. You have 30 seconds to go. And Uven says, doesn't make a difference. You can kill me if you want to. I'm not going to say one word. 11.59, 50 seconds, and the Arab counts down. 10, 9, 8, and the gun is pointed to his head. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and exactly at 12 o'clock, the Arab puts down his gun, extends his arm, and it says to Uven, Mazel Tov, you just moved up a rank. And Uven says, the only reason that I was able to go through this test is once I realized, in fact, it is a test. They're not Arabs. They're Jewish fellows just like me, working for the same organization. When we realize everything that happens to us is a test from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we're able to pass any test. No matter who does to you, what they do to you, it doesn't make a difference what happened to you. It's another test in order to move you up a rank. So you can get that big mazel tov. So you can join all the tzaddikim, attaining higher and higher levels of kedusha, of sanctity, of purity, ascending in the ladder, going closer and closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And we are able, and when we are able not only to pass the test, but to say thank you for the test, then Hashem says, I just want to give him more. I just want to shower him with more, in abundance. In Ruchnius and in Gashmius, with great simcha, with great, great love. 
That is perhaps what we learn from this Nisiyonis, from the great tests of Avraham Avinu. And that is what we should take and apply in our lives. Knowledge in its own is not power. Applied knowledge is. Let's learn from Avraham Avinu. Let's accept anything, anything that comes our way with great simcha, with great love, with great bitachon. The word da'aga in Hebrew, worry, is spelled with the letters Aleph, Gimel, Dalet, Hey. What's missing? Aleph, Gimel, Dalet, Hey. You're missing a bet. Yeah, of course, you're missing a bet. Because one who has bet, who has bitachon, doesn't have any worry, doesn't have any da'aga. Bet represents bitachon. Stress and pressure in Hebrew is lachatz. Who has lachatz? One who doesn't introduce Hashem into his day. But when you take Hashem, represented by the letter Yud, or represented by two hey, hey and hey, it's a Kodesh Baruch Hu. And you put the hey and the hey, the beginning and at the end of lachatz, turn the letters around and you find Hatzlacha. Because when you have Hashem involved, you're going to have much Hatzlacha. When you have Bitochon, you can have a life worry-free. No fear. No pressure. Just a constant spiritual growth. As if holding hands to a Kodesh Baruch You see a Kodesh Baruch in your life. How can you not be appreciative? Saying thank you. With simcha. Simcha in your heart. With great love. And then in Mitzvah Hashem we join the level of tzaddikim. In Mitzvah Hashem we should be able to do what the Tana Devei Eliyahu tells us. Tana Devei Eliyahu is Torah that we learn from Eliyahu Hanovi. And the Tana Devei Eliyahu says, Chayav Adam Loima. One has to say, it's obligated to say, Mata Yagiu Maasai Lemaasai Avotai Avoham Yitzchak V'Yaakov. When will my deeds reach those of my forefathers, Avoham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov? In Yitzchak Hashem, we should all be zoiche to that. So it's a great privilege and honor to speak on behalf of Chazak and on behalf of Chicken for Shabbos, chickenforshabbos.com. We all know the great work Chicken for Shabbos do. They, it's remarkable. Here and in Eretz soil, with tremendous mesilus nefesh, day in, day out, what they do is really amazing. And every dollar goes 100% to the chicken for Shabbos for the family that doesn't have. Not 98 cents out of the dollar, not 70. 100 cents out of one dollar goes to that great cause. So when you're involved with chicken for Shabbos, when you support them, you become like Avom Avinu, like Yitzhak Avinu, like Yaakov Avinu, taking care of others, the midah of chesed. And when we do chesed, measure for measure, HaKadosh Baruch Hu does chesed for us, in Mitzvah Shem, we should merit to see it in our own eyes.